So what is the legal status of the county of Maui? And I think some of you, if not most of you, might be a little shocked as far as what that history is. And I say that in a, actually a good way. So the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state was recognized in 1843. In fact, it used to be British. Hawaii used to be a part of the British Empire. Folks ever notice that Union Jack on the flag? That wasn't a British colony. Actually, Hawaii was a protectorate. Kamehameha I joined the British Empire in 1794 in an agreement with Captain Vancouver. We're actually British back then, not by nationality, which is different from English, which is ethnicity, right? British applies to a territorial area called Britain, right? That's how you know it's a nationality, not an ethnicity. Well, in 1843, we became Hawaiian again, right? And it had a government, a constitutional government, very progressive. Its laws were very progressive. But that government was unlawfully overthrown in 1893. And we also need to know and understand that by overthrowing a government in international law, you didn't overthrow the country. The country still exists. That's why you have obligations on the occupier who overthrew the government. And that's what we covered in Ben Vinisti's Law of Occupation. Now the legal status of the provisional government of 1893, well let's go to what President Cleveland concluded their status, their status was. Quote, he said to the US Congress, the provisional government was neither a government de facto nor de jure, okay? It didn't exist either in fact, as a successful revolution, or by law. He stated, in this state of things, if the queen could have dealt with the insurgents alone, her course would have been plain and the result unmistakable. So clearly Cleveland is referring to those in the provisional government, not as a government, but as insurgents. And then his conclusion, to the Congress, I believe that a candid and thorough examination of the facts will force the conviction that the provisional government owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States. These are trigger words in international law, invasion, overthrow. What did not come in was the law, the law of occupation. Now in 1894, the United States Foreign Relations Committee, chaired by Senator Morgan, they sought to vindicate Ambassador John Stevens from criminal liability. And the reason why, because ambassadors, in this case, the US Ambassador John Stevens in Hawaii, who ordered the landing of the troops, okay, and illegally recognized these insurgents, he had diplomatic immunity. And the international rule is that is not given amnesty. No, the territory, the country of the, of the, ter the, excuse me, the government of the country that was on the receiving end of that illegality could not prosecute that person. He had diplomatic immunity. But it is the duty of the sending state to prosecute. So President Cleveland basically indicted John Stevens through the Blunt, re through the Blunt Report. And also Captain Wilts the head of the captain of the USS Boston. So their job, the Foreign Relations Committee, was to vindicate so that John Stevens does not get prosecuted. And the proceedings started in January of 1894, which came to be known as the Morgan Report. A lot of people confuse the Morgan Report with the Blount Report. Well, basic civics 101 is the Mor Blount Report came out of the executive branch that represents the United States in international relations. The Morgan Report came out of the legislative branch, limited to U.S. territory. One does not trump the other. In fact, they are separated by effect. On January 20th, 1894, Stevens committed perjury before that committee. He actually committed perjury because a lot of people claim the Morgan Report vindicates Stevens. Actually, he lied. Now, we didn't know he lied until three years ago. I'm gonna show you the smoking gun. When asked by the chair of the committee, Senator Morgan, 
If Stephen's recognition of the provisional government was for the purpose of dethroning the queen, because see, that's the illegality. That's violating the duty of non-intervention. Stevens responded, oh, Stevens responded, not the slightest. Absolute non-interference was my purpose. Now, the committee believed them, at least a majority of them. All the Democrats said, no, we don't believe you, because the Blunt Report clearly shows facts that counter that. Well, W.O. Smith, remember that guy? William O. Smith, he was the attorney general for the so-called provisional government, the insurgent. His family gave paperwork that was in their family to the Hawaiian Mission House. Ron Williams, a PhD in history, went through every document. And that document that I'm gonna show refutes this. So this is from uh, Stevens in the report, in part of the Blunt Report. The late queen and cabinet accordingly yielded unconditionally, and the police station was turned over to Commander Soper and Captain Ziegler with 40 men from Company A. Mr. Wilson, the Marshal of the Hawaiian Kingdom, made a short address to the police force assembled in the station telling them that resistance was no longer feasible. The provisional government sent notifications of the situation to the representatives of foreign powers. The following answer to the request for recognition was received from His Excellency John Stevens. He, Stevens wrote, a provisional government having been duly constituted in the place of the recent government of Queen Lili Wokalani and said government being in full possession of the government building, the archives, the treasury, and in control of the capital of the Hawaiian Islands, I do hereby recognize the provisional government as the de facto government of the Hawaiian Islands. So that's the source of authority of the provisional government, the insurgents, who by the way, President Cleveland said, they were neither de facto nor de jure. Here's a smoking gun from the Hawaiian Mission House. You gotta be careful because of documents, yeah? They should have burned this. This is from the, let, on the letterhead of the U.S. legation, January 17th, 1893, Judge Dole. I would advise not to make known of my recognition of the de facto provisional government until said government is in possession of the police station. That means the provisional government was not in control. But yet, that proves U.S. Ambassador intervened in the internal affairs of the Hawaiian Kingdom. He committed perjury. So I call him a perjurer in absentia. <laughs> but that pretty much undermines the, blunt, the, the Morgan report. It was political. Cleveland's message is the key because the president represents the United States in foreign relations, not the Foreign Relations Committee. So the authority of the provisional government stems from this proclamation made by insurgents. It states here in the proclamation that all officers under the existing government are hereby requested to continue to exercise their functions and perform the duties of their respective offices with the exception of the following named people, the queen and her cabinet and Marshal Charles Wilson of the police force. Everyone in government was told to stay in place. All that was taken over was an entire governmental infrastructure. It's called a regime change, not a complete takeover of a new government. Like taking the pilot out of the cockpit, putting insurgents in it, and the US Marines are protecting them. And then, the second act of this provisional government relating to official oaths, all persons holding office under or in the employ or service of the government shall take within 20 days after the publication of this act the following oath. I hereby solemnly swear that I will support and bear true allegiance to the provisional government of the Hawaiian Islands and faithfully perform the duties appertaining to the office or employment of John Smith. Did you know that you're not supposed to sign oaths of allegiance under the laws of occupation. That's a violation of the law of occupation. And the provisional government is a proxy of the United States, admitted to by the United States president. 
So then the provisional government changed its name in 1894, these insurgents, to the Republic of Hawaii. But they're still insurgents. Then the authority of the territory of Hawaii was actually an act of Congress. It's a municipal law passed by the United States. And it says in section one under definitions that the phrase, the laws of Hawaii, as used in this act without qualifying words shall mean the constitution and laws of the Republic of Hawaii. So clearly there is a direct link of the territory to the insurgents. But what is important though, it's the governmental structure that maintained itself. They just renamed it. It's actually still the Hawaiian Kingdom governmental structure. And in section two under territory of Hawaii, it says the islands acquired by the United States of America under an act of Congress entitled joint resolution to provide for annexing the Hawaiian islands to the United States shall be known as the territory of Hawaii. Well, now we know that a joint resolution didn't annex anything because it couldn't. So the whole territorial act was relying on an American law called the joint resolution. You take out that keystone from the bridge, collapse. And then, in 1905 come the county governments under the County Act. I did not know <laughs> the genesis of why the counties were created. I knew though that the county governments under state law are very autonomous. It's almost unheard of in other states of the union. It's almost like they can run their own within their rules. They're not subject to approval by the governor or the legislature. So I shared this with a friend of mine, Professor Niklaus Schweitzer from the University of Hawaii. He says, Keanu, you don't know the formation of the county governments in Hawaii? I said, enlighten me, please. Because I couldn't find it in the Territorial Act, the counties. It's actually a legislative act. Okay? The Home Rule Party. The Home Rule Party was a political party which combined members of the Hawaiian Patriotic League and the Hui Kalai Aina. These were royalists, the ones who signed the signature petition against annexation and succeeded. That's who the Home Rule Party is. Because the Territorial Act allowed all people to vote, right? Because the Republic was keeping the Hawaiian royalists out, right? They only want their own insurgents involved. Well, the Territorial Act allowed them all to now participate. It was actually John Wise, Prince Kuhio, and others who came up with the idea that since the Territorial Legislature are all, majority were home rule, home rule party people, Hawaiian royalists, in order to deal with the fact that the governor under the Territorial Act is appointed by the president, they always had no means of redress. That's why Kuhio created Hawaiian Homes at the federal level, to get it out of the territorial control. Well, they also created the counties. And this bill was submitted, called the County Act of 1905, and it was vetoed by Governor Carter. He was a successor to Dole, who was the governor before him, appointed by the president. But that veto I mean, that veto was overridden by the Hawaiian legislature. And anyone who runs the counties had to answer to the Home Rule Party that elected them. That is how they took control and resisted U.S. control. Under the 1905 Act, the heads of the counties would be elected by the people who at the time were Hawaiians. It was resistance by Hawaiians to U.S. territorial control. That was interesting. I didn't know that, but it makes sense. The first two governors, the, sorry, the first two mayors of the city and county of Honolulu, where the name was changed from the county of Oahu to the city and county of Honolulu, were royalists. The third mayor, Johnny Wilson. Johnny Wilson was the son of Marshal Charles Wilson, head of the police force of the Hawaiian Kingdom. But once the influx of American citizens began to come to Hawaii, their population of 1,900, according to the 1890 census, by 1950, it exploded to 400,000. Now, the counties were taken up by others who would have the majority. But yet, its origin was resistance. 
and give voice to the Hawaiian people and their rights. Interesting. Yeah. Now, the 1959 Statehood Act, Public Law 86-3, that's another American law passed by the U.S. Congress, limited to U.S. territory. And the reason why it's limited to U.S. territory, because the U.S. Supreme Court says it is. It says neither the Constitution nor the laws passed in pursuant of it have any force in foreign territories. So the key is, Hawaii had to be a part of the United States in order for Congress to pass these laws. But yet Congress was relying on the joint resolution of annexation as a basis of passing the laws. But the joint resolution is no different than the Statehood Act because they're both legislative laws of the United States, which have no force in foreign territory. And then the court says, and operations of the nation in such territory must be governed by treaties, international understandings and compacts, and the principles of international law. This is where the law of occupation kicks in, and E.L. Benvenisti's chapter four. That's what the Supreme Court is referring to. And this is the most up-to-date law of occupation under international law. Now, in light of the United Nations human rights expert who sent his letter to three judges and other members of the judiciary of the state of Hawaii in 2018, this independent expert says, as a professor of international law, the former secretary of the UN Committee, Human Rights Committee, and co-author of that book, United Nations Human Rights Committee, Case Law, and currently serving as the UN independent expert on the promotion of a democratic and equitable international order, I have come to understand that the lawful political status of the Hawaiian Islands is that of a sovereign nation state in continuity, but a nation state that is under a strange form of occupation. Strange form because there's no administrative body administering the laws of the occupied state. That's how he's referencing it. Resulting from an illegal military occupation and a fraudulent annexation. As such, international laws, the Hague and Geneva Conventions require that governance and legal matters within the occupied territory of the Hawaiian Islands must be administered by the application of the laws of the occupied state, in this case, the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the domestic laws of the occupier, the United States. This is from Geneva, Switzerland. This is, he's not from here, but he's an international law expert that was appointed by the Human Rights Council with the United States as a party at that time. They appointed him as the UN independent expert. In fact, this man, Alfred Desaius, is a professor at the Geneva Institute of Diplomacy. But he's an American. He's an American. He went to Harvard Law School, but he got his PhD from a university in Germany, I believe. But his expertise is international law. So he's saying exactly what I'm saying here. It is I'm explaining it better. Important point, occupation does not transfer state sovereignty of the occupied state. We can look at FM 27-10, that's one of the manuals, field manuals used by the army in Iraq and Afghanistan. The law of land warfare. Section 358, occupation does not transfer sovereignty. Being an incident of war, got to keep in mind January 17th, January 16th when the invasion occurred, being an incident of war, military occupation confers upon the invading force the means of exercising control for the period of occupation. It does not transfer the sovereignty to the occupant, but simply the authority or power to exercise some of those rights of sovereignty. The exercise of these rights results from the established power of the occupant and from the necessity of maintaining law and order indispensable both to the inhabitants and to the occupying force. It is therefore unlawful for a belligerent occupant to annex occupied territory or to create a new state therein while hostilities are still in progress. Again, that cancels out the joint resolution of annexation from international law, but the U.S. Supreme Court canceled out the joint resolution under U.S. constitutional law. Annexation didn't take place. Under Section 362, necessity for military government. This is what Ben Vinesty was referring to in his chapter four. Military government is the form of administration by which an occupying power exercises governmental authority over occupied territory. The necessity of such government arises from the failure or inability of the legitimate government to exercise its function on account of the military occupation or the undesirability of allowing it to do so. Okay. The nature of government. 
It is immaterial whether the government over an enemy's territory consists in a military or civil or mixed administration. So the U.S. military can say they can create a civilian authority, not a military authority, to administer the laws of the occupied state. Now, how you administer the laws of the occupied state, you take over the governmental infrastructure of that, govern of that occupied state, you're just taking over the head. What changed from 1893 was only the head. The entire infrastructure remained the same. So we're, we're getting to a point where how do we fix the problem that we're currently in? But I just got to give this genealogy, right? Veiled admissions of illegality. 1988, U.S. Department of Justice, Office of Legal Counsel, stated regarding Hawaii's annexation by a joint resolution. It is therefore unclear which constitutional power Congress exercised when it acquired Hawaii by a joint resolution. Accordingly, it says, it is doubtful that the acquisition of Hawaii can serve as an appropriate precedent for a congressional assertion of sovereignty over an extended territorial sea. What is he saying in layman terms? The Congress cannot pass laws that go beyond its territory, which includes the territorial sea, whether three miles or 12 miles. In 1994, the Intermediate Court of Appeals in State of Hawaii versus Lorenzo, Judge Walter Heen, the ICA stated the essence of the lower court's decision is that even if, as Lorenzo contends, the 1893 overthrow of the kingdom was illegal, that would not affect the court's jurisdiction in this case. That was their position. So they denied the appeal. But Judge Heen added, however, the IC admitted, quote, its rationale is open to question in light of international law. And then the ICA also admitted, quote, the illegal overthrow leaves open the question whether the present governance system should be recognized. That was back in 1994. Judge Walter Heen, who was the author of the opinion, actually was a member of my doctoral committee. And had a, I, I know State v. Lorenzo from the judge who wrote the opinion. And I told to him, I asked him on appeal, back in 1994, if Cully Watson, who was the attorney for Lorenzo at that time in the appeal, I said, if Cully Watson, judge, gave you my doctoral dissertation, showing the existence of the Hawaiian Kingdom as an independent state, what would you have done? He told me I would grant the appeal and overturn the lower court's decision. I went, really? He said, I didn't know the difference, he said, between the state and the government. Now I do. He knows international law. And that's what prompted the exposure with Dexter Kayama and myself entering into these courts where I would serve as an expert witness that you saw earlier in providing this evidence. And when you provide this evidence, Dexter Kayama, an attorney, an old time attorney, he's not a young pup, Judge Hara, Third Circuit, Wells Fargo Bank versus Kawasaki. After defense attorney Dexter Kayama presented irrefutable evidence of the Hawaiian Kingdom's existence, Judge Howard stated this, veiled admissions of illegality. What you're asking the court to do is commit suicide because once I adopt your argument, I have no jurisdiction over anything. Not only these kinds of cases where you may claim either being a part of or being a Hawaiian, a citizen of the kingdom, but jurisdiction of the courts evaporate all of the courts across the state from the Supreme Court down, and we have no judiciary. I can't do that. That's from the transcripts. So nobody's refuting, because they can't, but they're exerting power. Now, who is the victim? Not Dexter, Dexter's the attorney. Elaine Kawasaki, who's Japanese from Hilo. Has nothing to do with race, all procedures. And then in 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court has to deal with this can of worms. In State of Hawaii versus Kaulia, it says, whatever may be said regarding the lawfulness of its origins, the State of Hawaii is now a lawful government. That's a fiat. That's a proclamation. That's not based upon judicial evidence. It's a statement. 
which now has been used by other prosecutors and plaintiffs and judges and cite, no, denied your, uh, your motion to dismiss, denied. And what you end up happening, and what's, ending, what's happening is you're racking up victims. That's what's happening. And there's a record of it, victims. Not just natives, just victims. People who are waking up to their rights, asking a question, get hit. House gone, incarcerated. This issue is due process, not whether or not guilt or innocence. Due process, rule of law. Well, the Hawaii Supreme Court, there was a judge from Third Circuit, Hawaii, Judge Nakamura reported Dexter Kayama to the Office of Disciplinary Counsel. Now they're gonna hit the attorney for making these arguments. Supreme Court in their decision, ODC versus Kayama in 2017, we conclude the respondent's accusations, Dexter Kayama, were not opinion based upon fully disclosed facts, but were mere allegations based upon tenuous legal analysis of broad statutory provisions which do not survive analysis. That's not what Judge Heen told me as a member of my doctoral committee. Then they go on to say, we conclude that Respondent Kayama's allegations imply a false assertion of fact, which could reasonably be interpreted as stating actual facts about their target, which are not true. They can't use evidence to say he's wrong. They use fiat, statements. That is not how a court is supposed to operate. They're not supposed to operate that way. But they do because this is what this information does. So what you're seeing here is these officials of the state of Hawaii are not responding to the crisis. They are reacting to the crisis. And people are getting hurt through that reaction. And they're trying to use Dexter Kayama and the attack against him by the Supreme Court on a censure to warn other attorneys don't bring this up in the court. Now, these actions actually show a pattern, and a pattern of criminal conspiracy under the law of occupation called war crimes. Failure to provide a protected person a fair and regular trial. Now it's just not the judge, it goes up the chain of command. These are the kind of issues, these facts, that are irrefutable because they're pleadings, are gonna be under the purview of the Royal Commission of Inquiry on whether or not criminal liability can be held on certain individuals and whether or not their, their, their action or conduct called actus reus and mens rea, the guilty mind, fits elements of the crime. One of the commissioners of the Commission of Inquiry from Europe is actually providing a legal opinion on the elements of war crimes in Hawaii and actus reus and mens rea and their connection. This is serious. This is not a game. But yet the records have already been met and people have been hurt. What I recommend, don't keep moving down that path of getting people hurt. Stop, pause, ask questions, even if the questions are hard. So what is the state of Hawaii under international law? It's not my opinion, it's already been confirmed by international law experts that I confer with. The state of Hawaii is not an occupying power established according to international law in order to administer the laws of the occupied state. State of Hawaii is a, it's a descendant, it's a successor of the provisional government, which you just saw, which as President Cleveland said, owes its existence to an armed invasion by the United States. Under the law of occupation, the state of Hawaii is an armed force. It's not a government. So the key here is the state of Hawaii today is an armed force under international law. The key is how do you transform it into a civilian administration to administer the laws of the occupied state so it can be fixed? See, that's the key. And whether or not international law allows that. And I can tell you, it does. So my job here is to explain how you folks can continue to do what you're doing within certain parameters. That's the key. So this is how it's gonna get fixed. And I'll 
make a direct application of this on a proposal of a bill for an ordinance, okay? Because we're in this committee. So I'm using it specifically for this committee, not the entire state of Hawaii, right? So the Council of Regency was formed in 1996 in similar fashion to the Belgian Council of Regency after King Leopold was captured by the Nazis in 1940. As the Belgian Council was established under Article 82 of the Belgian Constitution of 1821, the Hawaiian Council of Regency was established under Article 33 of the Hawaiian Constitution of 64 as amended. The Council of Regency is the successor to the government prior to its unlawful overthrow on January 17, 1893. It met the criteria of international law. That's why the Permanent Court of Arbitration could not deny its existence. It accepted it in the case Larson versus the Hawaiian Kingdom. That's important. So it was rule-based. It wasn't just self-declaration. Self it was a process. Now, in order to address the problem, so I already covered the fact that the occupying power does not have sovereignty, right? And that's under the rules of the law of occupation. But the occupied state still has sovereignty. And sovereignty is exercised by a government. Sovereignty is not the government. Sovereignty is in the country, okay? Governments exercise that authority. During occupations, as Ben Finisty pointed out, Governments of occupied states formed in exile or within the territory of the occupied state can still legislate. They have that authority to legislate. And Ben Benisti says the occupying power must apply that legislation if it's for the protection of the nationals or the people of the occupied state. Meaning the occupier has to take it into effect. Right now it's just hanging there. Well, remember that Texas situation where they had to deal with marriages and conveyances of property, especially with the Land Use Commission Committee. What, is, what, what do you folks have to deal with? Land titles, yeah? subdivisions, zoning. That's all based on title, but yet title stopped in 1893, just like no title transferred during the Civil War in Texas. And the Supreme Court had to come up and fix that and made that common law decision that it would recognize conveyances, lawful descents, and so forth. So in, in, in line with the United States Supreme Court, the, the Hawaiian Kingdom, Council of Regency, proclaimed provisional laws for the country. And you folks have a copy of that. So the Regency, serving in the absence of the monarch and temporarily exercising the royal power of the kingdom, and this is all verbiage from kingdom era law. To hereby acknowledge that acts necessary to peace and good order among the citizenry and residents of the Hawaiian kingdom, such for example as acts sanctioning and protecting marriage and the domestic relations, governing the course of descents, regulating the conveyance and transfer of property, real and personal, and providing remedies for injuries to person and estate and other similar acts which would be valid if emanating from a lawful government must be regarded in general as valid when proceeding from an actual though unlawful government, but acts in furtherance, in furtherance or in support of rebellion or collaborating against the Hawaiian Kingdom or intended to defeat the just rights of the citizenry and residents under the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom and other acts of like nature must in general be regarded as invalid and void. That needs to be taken into effect to create, to remedy the problem. That can't be denied. And that law also stated, the proclamation also stated that from the date of this proclamation, all laws that have emanated from an unlawful legislature since the insurrection began on July 6, 1887 to the present to include United States legislation shall be the provisional laws of the realm subject to ratification by the Legislative Assembly of the Hawaiian Kingdom once assembled with the express, express proviso that these provisional laws do not run contrary to the express reason and spirit of the laws of the Hawaiian Kingdom prior to July 6, 1887, the international laws of occupation and international humanitarian law. And if it be the case, they shall be regarded as invalid and void. One particular law that will be invalid and void is what I mentioned earlier, the Jones Act. Jones Act doesn't apply here. 
That's an American law. Plus, it runs contrary to Hawaiian Kingdom law. It benefits the merchant marines of the United States, right? Another act that is invalid, International Revenue Service, IRS taxes. Those can only be taxed amongst the citizenry in a foreign state, but cannot be applied in the territory of a foreign state. Hawaiian taxes, called State of Hawaii taxes, county taxes are recognized. That's what that means. Now, how do we bring the state of Hawaii into a position of being an administration recognizable under international law? What I'm pointing, what I'm pointing out to you folks here is there is a, a narrative that I'm explaining through the law. I'm just making it simple, but it's all law-based. It's all based on the principle of rule of law and compliance given a dire situation. So governments do have an inherent right to recognize foreign governments. You saw that with the US Ambassador John Stevens giving de facto recognition to the insurgents. But they were supposed to have been successful. They didn't meet that criteria. So therefore, they, that wasn't real. The Hawaiian Kingdom has that inherent right to recognize foreign governments. It does. So, on July 3rd, 2019, actually the council met and we had to discuss these issues. And this is how the county and the state. June 3rd. Huh? June 3rd, 2019. Yeah, June 3rd, 2019. Yes. Did I say another date? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Mahalo Chair. <laughs> June 3rd, 2019. Now therefore, we the Acting Council of Regency of the Hawaiian Kingdom, serving in the absence of the monarch and temporarily exercising the royal power of the kingdom, to hereby recognize the state of Hawaii and its counties as the administration of the occupying power, whose duties and obligations are enumerated in the 1907 Hague Regulations, the 1949 Geneva Convention, and international humanitarian law. And we do hereby further proclaim that the state of Hawaii and its counties shall preserve the sovereign rights of the ousted government and protect the local population from exploitation of their persons and property, both real and personal, as well as their civil and political rights under Hawaiian Kingdom law. Now, that's just the recognition of an entity, right? The key is, are we authorized to actually do that? We actually are, and the Permanent Court of Arbitration verified that we're actually a government. So it's not like it's a self-proclaiming, it's according to certain rules. Now, because of that, remember that 2013 Supreme Court decision in State of Hawaii versus Kaulia, where it said, whatever may be said regarding the lawfulness of its origins, the State of Hawaii is now a lawful government. Well, as of 2019, the proclamation of the Council of Regency Whatever may be said regarding the lawfulness of its origins, the state of Hawaii is now a lawful government, and all it needed was recognition. So now, how does this information apply to a bill for an ordinance coming out of the committee? Okay. Well, the origin of land titles throughout the Hawaiian Islands all stem from land commission awards and royal patents. So this is a tax map assessment, a tax assessment map with tax map keys. And if you notice, you see LCA, LC award. All titles in Hawaii originate 1845. Here's a land commission award. William Crowning Bird, Waikapu. From the evidence, it appears that the claimant, owning in right of his wife a small land in Waikapu by the name of Pili Pili, exchanged the same for Pu Pohoehoe in the year 1832. The land now claimed, and that he has con continued to occupy the same in peace down to the present time. This title is made clear by the first rule of the board. This is the Board of Land Commissioners, Board of Commissioners Quiet Land Titles. And we do therefore award to the aforesaid claimant, William Croningberg, a freehold title less than a lodial, or in other words, a life estate in the lands. What a lot of people 
need to realize is land commission awards were not all fee simple. It included leasehold, life estates, and fee simple. Now if it was a life estate, this person, Crowning Bird, would have to convert it into a fee. And that's when you get a royal patent. So all royal patents are fee simple that may have converted from a life estate. So here is uh, Crowningberg's uh, royal patent. And if you look at the top, it refers to Kuliana Helu 433. He converted his life estate into a fee simple title. That's what that royal patent means. But I want to draw your attention on what is in Hawaiian law a condition of all land title transactions. Oops. <coughs> Reserving the rights of native tenants. Oh, wait, sorry. That's, oh. Koi ke kuleana una kanaka. Koi nai na kuleana una kanaka maloko. Reserving the rights of native tenants. That's a condition in all property. But that's in Hawaiian. Here is a row pattern in English to Robinson. You also have that provision, reserving the rights of native tenants in English. What is reserving the rights of native tenants? In Kekiki versus Edward Dennis, the Hawaii Supreme Court stated, and this was by Judge William Lee, moreover said the court, even if the king had not made this reservation on the deed, the plaintiff's title would be good, for the people's lands were secured to them by the constitution and laws of the kingdom, and no power can convey them away, not even that of royalty itself. The king cannot convey a title greater than he has, and if he grants lands without reserving the claims of tenants, the grantee must seek his remedy against the grantor and not dispossess the, peop dispossess the people of their callow patches. So the rights are secured in constitutional law. Right? So that means native tenant rights are there, which are not just how a native will derive land, a kuleana, but also gathering. But all of this is defined by Hawaiian law, not American law. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I was asked, do you need to use the lua? I said, this is like me teaching class up at UH again, a graduate course. <laughs> and I appreciate your folks' uh, time to learn a lot of information that is being presented, and I hope I'm able to explain it in such a way that it, it appears comprehensive. That's the key. Um, but I just have a few more slides, yeah? And then we'll open up for questions and answers. But I couldn't get to this point until I could cover all of that beforehand, right? So, also under Hawaiian Kingdom law, with regard to land, it's not just subject to the rights of native tenants and how it is defined under Hawaiian Kingdom law, but it also applies to what is called the law of sepulture. Sepulture deals with burial sites, okay? So in 1860, an act was passed by the Hawaiian legislature for the protection of places of sepulture. Being enacted by the king, the nobles, and representatives of the Hawaiian Islands and legislative council assembled, if any person, not having any legal right to do so, shall willfully dig up, disinter, remove, or convey away any human body from any burial place or shall knowingly aid in such discernment, discern, discernment, removal or conveying away every such offender and every person and accessory thereto either before or after the fact shall be punished by imprisonment at hard labor for not more than two years or by a fine of not exceeding $1,000. $1,000 in 1860 according to the inflation calculator is $28,000. So it shows that was a very serious issue back in the kingdom. Yeah. But that is Hawaiian kingdom law. It was never repealed. Now, what runs con inconsistent to Hawaiian law on burial? The Native American Grave Repatriation Act. That's a federal law. That has nothing to do with Hawaii. That's the law that deals with burial sites. I think that would put a halt to people digging up Evie when they realize there's a law. right? So, how can, and I say I'm just proposing in light of this information, to be made as far as decisions by the council members themselves and the chair with regard to this particular committee on land use, how to move forward 
under a bill for an ordinance. So in this case, bill number draft to 127, section one has a purpose clause and then followed by the normal understanding of amending the code, <laughs> depending what proposal you folks are taking under consideration. So what I would recommend to make sure that there's a record so that the Commission of Inquiry knows full well that what the county is doing is in line with the law of occupation is to put in a purpose clause, just a purpose clause, nothing else. Everything else flows nor normal. And a recommended purpose clause for consideration. Section one, in accordance with international humanitarian law, Article 43 of the 1907 Hague Convention number four, and Article 64 of the 1949 Geneva Convention, the council is authorized to legislate, uh, should be four, <laughs> for the territory of Maui County as a duly recognized administration of the occupying power of the United States of America. This bill for an ordinance is subject to the rights of native tenants and the law of sepulture. That's it, something simple. And that is a, a record that if somebody looks at it from an international law standpoint, that fits the criteria of legislating. Now, this is strictly for this particular committee, and that's why I'm focused on that, but it could apply to all other ordinances or resolutions because it is admitting that the county is authorized to legislate, but within the confines of the Hague and Geneva Conventions and international humanitarian law. So when we say the law of occupation, the law of occupation is to administer the laws of the occupied state, not to administer international law. International law just says how you're supposed to administer the laws of the occupied state. So there is a continuum that has started in 1840 and the legislative acts and constitutional provisions that still are relevant today. Now, if we were to take a look at the genesis as to the county's formations in 1905, it was a form of resistance against the United States territorial government for the benefit of Hawaiian subjects. That is now flipped. Now the counties are not in a position of resistance, but actually compliance and it extends beyond Hawaiian royalists of the Home Rule Party to now protected persons, which are all civilians, irrespective of race, color, creed, or nationality that are residing in Hawaii right now. So that's what I have for my presentation, an example. But the main thing here that I want you to walk away with is having some understanding of what is international law. And the paperwork that I provided on the PowerPoint, the council members all have a copy of that. And I'm open to uh, any questions that you folks may have with regard to what was presented. Or do I need your two? Okay, I'm sorry.